Some time ago, a good friend of mine sent me a quote. I'm pretty sure it was Sean. Uh, but he sent me this quote. It's by, perhaps it's by, I've not been able to verify this, Anton de Saint-Exupéry, who wrote The Little Prince. And he was very, uh, just a, a man about all things, scientists, literature, everything. And so he wrote these words, we believe. If you wish to build a ship, do not divide the men into teams and send them into the forest to cut wood. Instead, teach them to long for the vast and endless sea. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people together to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work. But rather, teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And if you want to build a ship, don't, don't drum up people and men and women to gather wood. Don't give orders. Don't divide the work. Instead, teach them to long for the vast and endless sea. I have that printed uh, in my office at home, my office at work. It just always resonates with me that the goal is not project management. The goal is an overwhelming love for Jesus. And in fact, that's what Paul has done uh, from the beginning of chapter 1, most notably through the beginning of chapter 2. In Philippians 1.27, Paul tells his friends, conduct themselves as citizens of heaven with steadfastness and selflessness. And so to do that, he starts to describe how you get to that place. And in the end of chapter 1, he talks about a kingdom-focused walk. Oh, live your life as citizens of the kingdom. At the beginning of chapter 2, in verse 1 through 4, he talks about a kingdom-focused fellowship, compassion, humility, a love that would maintain and deepen their unity with each other. Two weeks ago, we talked about the mind of Christ in verses 5 through 8. And it was the descending path of Jesus' humiliation. And then it ends at the low point of the cross. And he's making the point that this is what Jesus did uh, on your behalf. This is the move from the throne room of heaven to a death on a cross on your behalf. Then in verses 9 through 11, he talks about his exaltation. And the mind of Christ was the description of Jesus' actions. The mind of the Father was the, the thoughts of of the exaltation of Jesus himself from the, the cross to an exaltation of the pinnacle of glory to be worshipped by every creature everywhere. And now as we look at verses 12 through 18, it's kind of a to-do list, but it's really based on all of that information. Paul has said to us, look at the vast and endless majesty of Jesus. Look at the glory and unending glory of Jesus. Yearn for that glory. Yearn to be part of that, that endless worship of your King. Look what He has done for you. And so this morning as we look at verses uh, 12 through 18, we want to remember that, that Paul is talking to a congregation uh, not about the work of the church, not about uh, the work of individuals, but he's talking about a love we have for Jesus that binds us together and overflows into our behavior because we will act as we believe. Paul knows that. And so that sets us up for the beginning of, uh, of these verses this morning. So before we start, let me pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your glory, for your majesty. Uh, and in this little room this morning, uh, we are the recipients of that grace, of that glory, of that majesty no less than the church at Philippi, no less than the church at Ephesus, no less than, than any group of believers uh, all through history. And so, Father, this morning we thank you for that. We thank you uh, that you do not measure our worship or our worth uh, by numbers or by our talent, uh, but by your love, which is unendless and perfect and not withheld in any way. And so, Father, I thank you for that, and I pray your blessing on us. I break, play, pray that you protect my words, that you protect our hearing, that you use this morning for your glory, for your honor. I pray that you give us a desire to see God's glory, to see your glory, to see Jesus' glory manifest uh, through us and in us and in our body, uh, that we would uh, put ourselves aside as citizens of the kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we start, Paul now kind of 
doesn't really change gears, but now he kind of takes his focus and puts it on this little congregation. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence. Paul knows it's really easy to stay fired up when the coach is in the room. He knows it's easy to stay fired up when the guy who, who came and planted churches all over the known world is in your midst. He knows it's easy to stay motivated in that kind of environment. But he also knows that human leaders come and go. But the Lord himself is never absent. And he's always present at the work of enabling our actions. And so their continued obedience is not dependent on the presence of a project manager with a timeline and a clipboard in hand or on a series of discipleship books or some notes that some world-class speaker has given us, but on the internal motivation and divine power of the indwelling spirit. God has revealed himself to us, has indwelled us in our spirit and with his spirit. And so Paul has tried in these past few verses to give us a glimpse of that as the motivation for everything that comes next. But he speaks pretty much directly to his concern. And he exhorts uh, these believers to, the be, to be witnesses for Jesus two ways. First, he says, work out your own salvation. Then he says, they're to realize that, that the, the enabling for that is the work of God within them. And so there's the, the work of your own in verse 12, and God who is at work in verse 13. So first, we look at verse 12, work out your own salvation. It is super easy to misunderstand this verse. Because in our natural reading of it, we apply our own understanding of it. Work out your own salvation. It sounds like there's a whole long list of things I have to do to accomplish the goal of salvation. Well, first thing we notice about it is that the word your is not singular, but plural. Paul is saying to the congregation, work out your salvation. He's not saying to an individual, work out your salvation. He's saying, as he has said from the beginning of the, of the book, to the congregation, you are united together. You're to put yourself aside for each other. You're to be humble. Why? Because Jesus was humble. He paints a picture of Jesus' humility, a work for all creation. So now when he says, work out your own salvation, and uses the plural, it points us not to our individual salvation, not for the work of grace that happens to us individually, that is unmerited and unearned and unworked for, but the corporate group of believers as a church. And so it would be strange to tell the Philippians to concentrate on themselves after all he's told them about putting themselves behind them. And even though... They and we are expected to respond individually to the gospel and to Jesus' grace poured out on us. It's imperative we do that in the context of our community life, in the context of the community of believers, in the context of our koinonia, our fellowship. And then he says, work out. And the, the verse uh, uses a word for immediate action. It's, it's an imperative. It's a command. It's... Uh, it carries the same weight as uh, blue lights and a siren behind you on the road, which means pull over immediately. Uh, we were walking back from downtown yesterday, and uh, you're kind of a blue. I was kind of oblivious to what was going on until the police cars zip by us at 87 miles an hour. With those blue lights and siren running and whatnot, and we thought somebody's getting a ticket. I am glad I am walking because it's not me. And some distance up the road, the natural result. Uh, the person had pulled over. Why? Because that siren in the state of North Carolina is an imperative. It requires an immediate action. Do this right now. That's the same weight that work out carries. Notice what Paul does not say. He does not say work for your salvation. He doesn't say work towards your salvation. He doesn't say work at your salvation. He says work out your salvation. If we're working at a problem, it, it kind of implies that we don't know the outcome. The outcome is, is still up in the air. But to work out a problem suggests that it's being resolved, to carry the work through to its conclusion. The present outworking of their grace-given salvation within the believing community of Philippi is what's in view here. How do we know that? Because around the same time he was writing to the Philippians, between 60 and 62 A.D., Paul is also writing to the Ephesians, the Colossians, and the letter to Philemon. They're known as the prison officials, prison epistles. 
and they're written during his first imprisonment in Rome. So Paul wrote to the Ephesian church about the same time he writes this letter, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So we know Paul did not forget or teach the Ephesians something different than he's teaching the Philippians. So when he says, work out your own salvation, you're not talking in conflict with Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which he may have written just before or just after this letter. What he's saying is there's something else at work here. We remember that Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So Paul is exhorting them to live out their Christianity in such a way that those who don't know Jesus, those with whom they have daily contact with, would either be attracted to their lives or hear the truth of Jesus as their Savior as an opportunity to share the gospel. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a, a pastor and seminary professor in the 1940s in Germany and had opportunity to leave when the Nazis took power, came to America, uh, had to go back, was drawn back by the Spirit of God. He said, uh, who will preach the truth if I'm here? So he goes back to Germany, is eventually convicted of the, uh, a conspiracy to kill Hitler, uh, and is hung just days before his concentration camp is liberated. One of the, one of the last people hung uh, before they were liberated. Bonhoeffer had said these, live, these words, Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. And I believe that is directly related to John 13, 35. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The love he talks about is extraordinary, it's unusual, it is unnatural, it is divinely oriented, it is divinely empowered, it is divinely given. And so Paul says, when he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, what he's saying is, live a life, present yourself, to the culture, in, in the empowering of your individual salvation, but in the strength of your corporate unity. He says, with fear and trembling. Again, these are, are words Paul has used before. Paul used them to describe the attitudes of the Ephesian slaves who have to work for non-Christian masters. And again, he's writing these two letters within, certainly within years of each other, within a year or so of each other, perhaps even a more, more tight window but he says to the Ephesians, bond servants, of which he has already characterized himself, bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. The immediate context, as well as the larger context of Scripture, indicates that he's speaking of having an attitude of reverence and respect towards their non-Christian masters. It was the kind of attitude towards those people that we should have towards Christ's authority in our own lives. But as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Paul's telling them, hey, if you're going to live your life out, if you're going to going to demonstrate the gospel, you better be the best employee they ever had. They better be looking to recruit other believers from your church because you are are the the most respectful, most diligent, working as though you are working for your king and not an unbeliever. And so that's why Paul exhorts the, the Ephesians to obey these unbelieving masters just as they would obey Christ himself. In Colossians he says very much the same thing, and then in verse 23 he adds to the thought, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that, the Lord, that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. What's he telling them? Hey, you're not working here for the paycheck. You're working for Jesus. Wherever you are, he's your boss. And whatever work you do, you do it as though... He is the one in charge, as though you are doing it for Him. Why? So that we can be in a place to present and to, to manifest the gospel. And how do we do it? Verse 13, For God who works in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. The assurance that working is not something the Philippians have to do alone. It's not some strength they have to manifest on their own. It's not some, some attitude they have to generate on, in the morning before they get in their cars to go to work or their chariots 
or their sandals to get to work. They go to work knowing that God is at work in them and they are manifesting that work to everyone they come in contact with. Verse 13 really echoes what he said in chapter 1. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Now he says, it is God who works in you. That one who works in you will bring it to completion. And so he admonishes them, as one commentator said, to work out what God has worked in. Demonstrate the work that God is doing in your life by the work that you do outside, by the work that the world sees, by the work of the unity of the church. And the term that he uses for in you, again, is easily misunderstood as a a singular, as a, a personal thing, but it really could be translated among you. It's a command that focuses not on their individual sanctification, but rather on maintaining corporate unity in the church. Paul's concern is not confined to the individual's quest for holiness, but rather on their growth together into the pattern that he's already described of self-sacrificing, other-serving love that he showed the, the perfect example of in Jesus. Same commentator who talked about working out what's worked in said, throughout the New Testament, growth in godliness is a group project. I don't know if you ever had group projects when you were in school. They are terrible. Uh, uh, You are either in the group where you feel like you do all the work or where you feel like nobody else knows what's going on except you. Uh, I know that nobody in this room was that person who thought, well, I won't do anything because this person's really smart and they're going to do it all. I know there's nobody here like that, but those people do exist. They're not here, though. But it's a perfect example of what Paul is talking about. It's a group project. What does that mean? We each have a portion. We each have a share. We each bring some talent to that work. Not because we are better educated or or holier or more sanctified, but because God works in us individually for the corporate revealing of the gospel. Paul's concern uh, is not only for the community of believers. And if we see it that way, if we see it as a, a conflict between corporate community versus the individual believers, then we try to separate what the Bible really keeps together. The health and well-being of Jesus' church cannot be severed from our individual growth in Christ's likeness. And so after emphasizing that salvation is by grace, through faith alone, and not by works to the Ephesians, the very next verse in Ephesians chapter 2 is, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I saw a quote uh, not very long ago, and somebody had had mentioned it uh, probably here, uh, that God's plan is not thwarted by our ignorance. He's already built our incompetence into the plan, right? He's already already taken that into account. Man, nothing is more uh, comforting than that thought. Uh, So Paul says, you're not working out your salvation to become saved You are working out, you are manifesting, you are demonstrating God's work in you through your work with each other. He says that leads directly, as you see here, to our witness. The the work that's being done in our lives, the work of the congregation, the work of Jesus, flows out into our witness. Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing. As soon as I read it, I was reminded of, of the Israelites in the wilderness. They're out in the wilderness for... Uh, I mean, they've slept just like a couple nights in the wilderness. And what do they say? Hey, can we go back to slavery? That was kind of awesome. Let's do that again. Because uh, we're, we're grumbling, complaining. Why? Because they were the perfect example of us. Uh, some of these people in, in Philippi, I'm quite certain, were slaves, uh, as they were in Colossae and Ephesus. They're probably persecuted. They were probably under immense pressure. It naturally resulted in a tendency to grumble and complain about their condition. The grumbling and complaining really betrays an attitude that doubts God's goodness and sovereignty. It doubts that God is at work in my circumstances. It doubts that God knows my situation. And it brings us again to self-focus. It brings us to think, why me? Those things are, those are natural thoughts. So I don't want to portray that as, as some sinful uh, attitude that we have. It is an attitude, though, 
that points to ourselves as opposed to our king. I had a conversation with a friend of mine the other day, and uh, he's, he's in a, a very bad situation, and he talked about how God, he knew that God was in charge and that God's plan was perfect, whatever it brought to him. He, was, he might not be happy about it, but he's willing to accept it as it is, as the perfect plan. And I said, God's plan is always perfect. It is just not always easy. And that's where, that's where maturity comes in. When we recognize the difference between perfect and easy. When we recognize that God's perfect plan is not for our comfort and ease and security. God's perfect plan is for his glory. And we are the workmen to manifest that to the world. That's our job. So Paul says, do all things without the grumbling and disputing. That, why? So that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. So Paul emphasizes the importance of this consistent and constant Christian life. The important thing of this lifestyle is to be a witness to those in darkness. The purpose for us not grumbling and disputing is that you can be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, as a witness in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. And I've said to, to people many times, if, if you just need to complain, call me up, because then no one else will know about it. It'll just be between us, and, and we can kind of get it off our chests and, and move on. Paul says these things by themselves, they hurt the witness to the kingdom, especially when they are conducted outside the confines of those who, who understand our nature and our, our place. The world is engulfed in darkness, and it is besieged by a culture of death. We see that as, as much or, or more than they saw it in the first century. And so Paul says at the end of verse 15, what the solution for that crooked, twisted generation is who lives in darkness, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Paul portrays the, the church as fulfilling Israel's promise role of being a light to the nations over and over again in the old testament especially in isaiah israel is called a light to the nations daniel in daniel 12 says those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above and those who turn many and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever remember that in that age the stars were the the guide points for travel that's how you figured out where you were. That's how you figured out where you were going. You think to yourself for a minute, uh, Columbus leaves Portugal and finds any land whatsoever is amazing in itself because you're on a boat like this big out in the middle of the vast and endless sea. You really don't know up from down, left from right, east from west, unless you can navigate by the stars, unless you know where the sun comes up and where the sun goes down, unless you know what what star appears where all the time. Daniel says, that's us. We are the road map to salvation. We are the road map to righteousness. We are the stars that shine as a light to the world. And so Paul uh, says to this minority who are threatened with the danger of cultural absorption, just like we are, that will ultimately shred their witness to God, he says to them, be blameless and pure, because you are the road map for the world around you. You are the ones who lead them from a crooked and twisted generation to the glory of the King of all creation. So when we mingle with non-believers, when we work for non-believers, and we do it with a reverent and respectful attitude, when we don't complain and don't argue, when we live blameless and pure lives, we shine like those stars that navigate, that lead the way. If we are truly stars, then the unbelieving world should be able to look at local, local bodies of Christians and see oneness and the beauty of Jesus reflected in them. Paul writes to the Corinthians that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. That should be what the world sees when they see us. And so in the middle of this, this darkness, a light will shine from us, not just as individuals, but corporately. And the Holy Spirit chooses to use the unity of believers in the body of Christ as a means to explain the reality of the incarnation. 
we are one in Christ, Christ is one with the Father, and became a man to provide eternal redemption for the world. The whole picture is a a picture of, of the oneness that exists, not just in the Trinity, but between us and Jesus, and between us and each other. And so he tells him in verse 16, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And holding fast could really be translated two ways, just like much of what we've talked about. It could mean to hold on to, or it could mean to hold out for. He's talking about the word of life. It's a thing that they've received from Paul. Paul uses the term to the Thessalonians. We also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. He writes to them essentially the same thoughts he's writing to the Philippians, but the term, the word of life, is the gospel. It's the truth about who Jesus is. It's the Jesus of the Bible. It's the the description of the work of grace. And so he wants them to hold on to it, to to have confidence in it, to remember it, not to stray from good doctrine. Remember last week when Paul is looking for a way to describe the unity of the church and how they overcome individual issues and problems. What does he do? He dives into the most intense piece of doctrine in, in maybe in anywhere in the New Testament, the incarnation of Jesus, the, the death of Jesus on the cross, the exaltation of Jesus. Those verses from 5 through 11 are, are some of the highest picture of Jesus in the entire Bible. And Paul says, this lofty doctrine, this solves your everyday problem. This solves your you-took-my-seat-in-church problem. This solves the hey-you-didn't-greet-me-appropriately problem. This solves the uh, you name it. This, this solves the problem. Whatever the problem is, this is, is going to solve it. And so he tells them, hold on to that. Hold on to that truth of the gospel. But if they're going to be shining stars, if they're going to be constellations that mark the pathway to righteousness then it's the same thing, at the same time that they hold on to it, they have to hold it forth. They have to offer it out. They have to explain the truth of it. And Paul, because Paul says there is a day coming when our life's work will be examined, the day of Christ. And Paul says, I don't want to be found running in vain. He's not talking about losing his salvation. He's not talking about being a poor workman, because we know by this time Paul had had put his neck on the chopping block for the church. What he's saying is, it's an image of his, when he uses the term running here, it's an image of his missionary work and his manner of life. And so he's thinking about a day when he stands before the throne room of all creation. And people are gathered there who are there because of the work that Paul has done. What he's saying is, don't miss the point, not for my glory, but so that you will arrive at the place I, I would love for you to arrive at, the throne room of all creation in that day of judgment. That his work would not be without merit, without fruit. And then he tells us in the last two verses, the overflow even of that work is in the fellowship. And so uh, you'll notice that it does not start with a W. That is to prove that I do not have OCD. I guess the contrary to that is the fact that I'm still thinking about the fact that that does not start with W. Uh, Even now, I'm trying to think of a good word for that. and cannot. But Paul says all of these things, they manifest in, in our fellowship. Even if I am poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. The whole idea of a drink offering is that Paul is pouring himself out in this sacrificial imagery, because a drink offering is an Old Testament sacrifice into Numbers and Kings, Hosea, Jeremiah. And Paul says, uh, there is a cost and a value in view when we sacrifice for the kingdom. It's an act of worship when we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. What Paul is saying, I am pouring out my life for the kingdom. And then he links it to their word, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. So Paul links his being poured out with the Philippians' sacrificial service. 
And he recalls the partnership in their defense and confirmation of the gospel in the beginning of the book, in, in, chap, in verse 7. He suggests that both he and they are making a sacrificial offering. The Philippians sacrifice their comfort, their ease, their prosperity, and in possibly many cases their own lives for the kingdom. And because that's true, because they share the same struggle, because they share the same kingdom outlook, the same kingdom attitude, they should share the same joy. The picture of joy that, that comes up over and over again in this book. We're reminded that Christian joy is not some private happiness, but it's something that invites the involvement of the entire community. It's not, I am happy with my place with the kingdom outlook. It's we are happy. We are joyful. We love to see one another. We love to spend time with one another. We love to be in communion with one another. Because when the world sees that, and they say, what draws these people together to self-sacrifice, to humility, to a love for one another, I I would like to, to know what that is. We are the road map to the gospel. And so then finally, We've, we've talked over and over again about an indwelling God who bears the marks of activity all through these few verses. We see God at work. He's active. He's the encouraging truth of what Paul writes here is that God never sleeps. He's tireless. He's active. We forget and He never forgets. We stop. He never stops. He's the active indweller in the empowerment of the work He's given us. He's effective. Paul uses words that say that God... The word for work that he uses for God is a word that that means it will achieve its purpose. We're not trying to figure it out. We're working it out. We're we're demonstrating it. And so the outcome is guaranteed. He can't be deflected from the course, nor can the course fail to achieve his purpose. He's a God at work. He'll bring it to completion. Again, first uh, Philippians one six, I am sure of this, who began a good work and you will bring it to completion. Jesus saving work is comprehensive. He rescues us not only from sin's guilt and punishment, but also from its controlling power. Not only from personal defilement, but also from interpersonal defilement, interpersonal alienation. He rescues us from guilt and punishment. He takes our place. Jesus does it all apart from us. All of the rescue that we have from guilt and punishment happens apart from us. Jesus obeys in our place. He suffers in our place. He rises to victorious life in our place. And he gives us faith by his spirit. Our salvation includes not only our reconciling to God through the cross, but our reconciling to one another through the cross. And so as members of the family of God, we are able to work out the comprehensive big picture of salvation that Jesus achieved and is applying to individuals through spirit-given faith and repentance. I want to remember this is not a call to passive in action. When Paul says, walk by the Spirit, he says it over and over and over again in light of the fact that by grace we live in the Spirit. Third John says, who testify to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on a journey in a manner worthy of God. Paul says to the Thessalonians, to the Colossians, to the Ephesians, over and over again, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Work, walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you have been called. Walk in a manner worthy of God. God works in us, so we desire to do the loving deeds that make his saving purpose visible in his church. Paul invites the Philippians and us to share this Christ-centered, kingdom-focused attitude for our own love for one another, but also for the work that he's put before us in the world, that we might, again, be the stars that draw men from darkness, from a corrupt generation, into the light. Let me pray. Father, thanks again for your care for us, for your love for us. Thanks for your words. Uh, Thanks for the lights and stars that you put before us to draw us to your side. Father, we recognize that we have a, a mighty work before us, even in our own day. And I thank you that we do not have to figure out the plan. We don't have to drum up the emotion. We don't have to... Uh, find the strength. We just have to yearn for the vast and endless glory of your Son. We have to yearn to know Him and to see Him and to love Him the way He loves us. 
and that we love one another the way we are loved. That we forgive and treat one another the way we have been forgiven and the way we have been treated. Father, I thank you that you empower us with your spirit, that you inform us with your word, and that your end is certain. Prepare us, equip us, strengthen us, uh, Father, to, to be those people in this very place, in this very day, in this town, in this environment, in this economy, in this political environment, in all the things that we deal with every day, Father, let us be shining stars on the path to righteousness. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.